Good evening, everyone. I'm Shoma Chaudhry, and Nina, Ritu, I, and all the other women of Algebra join me in welcoming you all here today. We're delighted to have the kind of lineup we do because in many different ways, all of them are from different battle lines. The first two speakers are defenders of the Constitution in very, very different ways. At a time when we have been across the country discussing ideas of nationalism and patriotism, how to deal with our borders, what is the, you know, the relationship between ourselves as citizens, our loyalties, our ideas of discipline, our ideas, as I said, of relationships with each other, even as we constantly evolve our idea of nationalism and patriotism and our responses to our neighbors. It is a particular privilege to have someone from the army, the deputy chief of the Indian army, General Zamruddin Shah, more popularly known and more recently known as Zoom Shah, because he has served in every battlefront that this country has seen over the last 50, 60, 70 years. He's served in the Indian 1971 war against uh, Pakistan over the Bangladesh war. He's been on the Punjab front quelling the insurgency. He was in Gujarat quelling the riots. He served in the Northeast and in Kashmir. And it's not just that he'll be telling us stories about the battles and about the battlefield, but as I said, underlying that is a constant conversation about our ideas of nationhood, citizenship, and patriotism. He's been at the heart of those battles, and it'll be very interesting to hear his perspective on our most contemporary conversations. In addition to this, General Zoom Shah has also been the Vice Chancellor of uh, uh, Aligarh Muslim University. And so to that extent, he's been at the forefront of another battlefront, which is our relationship with our minorities and how we see them and their right to equal citizenship, how they see themselves in relationship to the country, and he has been at the forefront of that. General Shah wrote a book last year called Sarkari Musulman, and that is something which uh, looks back at his life, it looks back at his childhood, but also at the identity of being Muslim in this country. And in, when we have only two and a half percent people in the Indian army from the Muslim community, uh, it is something to reflect on, on what that experience is as well. So to cast light on all of that and to get his perspective, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming General Zoom Shah. Uh, I forgot to mention that General uh, Shah has another claim to notoriety, which is that he's the elder brother of Nasiruddin Shah, and uh, he's had to, as he says, live under the shadow of a celebrity brother, but we'll come to that as well. So as you can see, he's really fought many war fronts, and it's wonderful to have you here, sir. So, you know, you, you come from a family that's been in some uh, kind of military service for more than 200 years. Uh, you know, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, your father, in fact, almost got shot by cannons in Afghanistan. And so that's a very long and proud lineage. I'm going to come to all of that later, but I wanted us to start in the absolutely urgent contemporary conversation, which was the Pulwama attack and then our strikes on Pakistan, their counter airstrike, and the rhetoric that has built up around it. Uh, before I ask you specific questions on that, give us your analysis of what happened. Uh, do you think the government took correct decisions? What made you feel proud about it? And what do you have some reservations about? Thank you. Uh, let me caution you. I'm not a warmonger uh, and, or an ultra-nationalist. Uh, I have soldiered for 40 years, uh, seen people who I played basketball one evening, drop dead the next day, shot by terrorists in uh, Manipur. So I have seen uh, bloodshed, and uh, all I would say is that um, I follow the d dictum of the acme of a successful general is to win a war without fighting. If a general can do that, I think he's achieved a lot. Um, <laughs> the ultra-nationalists may not agree with me, but I think there's sense in all that. So I've been, uh, I'm not privy to any of the national secrets at all, but I've been following uh, what has happened. Uh, uh, Pakistan 
adopted the policy of inflicting a thousand wounds on India. And for many, many years, uh, we did not know the ideal way of how to uh, repost, how to react. Uh, because uh, unfortunately, what has happened, the nuclear parity uh, between both the nations um, hindered us from taking any worthwhile action. And so we kept absorbing uh, the cuts. We had an attack on parliament. We've had so many um, casualties. In fact, unfortunately, uh, in the last uh, few years, the number of casualties amongst the armed forces has risen. Uh, uh, this does not indicate any, in any way uh, um, something unfortunate. It, it happens. Uh, the casualty rates rise and fall, but uh, we have to be careful. Uh, this is primarily the casualties have been inflicted on the paramilitary forces because they've been given a task for which they were not trained. They've been given a task for police action. Uh, I found that uh, the paramilitary forces really lack uh, the training and the equipment to be committed against uh, hardcore terrorists. And um, uh, so they have to, uh, I'll tell you another surprising thing is that uh, in the army, uh, a unit, that means a battalion, uh, goes into battle together. The commanding officer and the officers stay with the men, not so in the police or paramilitary forces. For example, a battalion commander of a CRPF or a BSF battalion may have his companies in JNK, but he would be probably in the headquarters in Delhi. Now that I think is a ridiculous way of um, exercising command and control. The essence or the, the presence of officers with their troops is totally essential. I mean, uh, we General, talk of- General uh, Shah, just just to bring you back uh, to the Kashmir question and, and the contemporary situation there, uh, the question was, what was your analysis of, are you, are you bringing up the CRPF command control issue, which is a very important one, but is that what happened with the convoys that was, that was going, that there was no one in command, no one really uh, analyzing whether that was the correct move? Is that the point you're making? And what is, your, as I said, your analysis of the government's response to the Pulwama suicide right. bomb attack? So, so I think uh, what the, the government did is a very measured and uh, balanced response. Um, we uh, destroyed uh, the, um, the JEM headquarters. Uh, there has been uh, a large number of uh, doubts, question marks, because what was initially reported or shown on the Google was um, the buildings which had not been destroyed. Uh, now let me tell you that um, what the, the warheads used uh, by, the, by the Indian Air Force were the 2,000 bombs, uh, which only make a pinhole pierce through the roof. I mean, they pierce through the roof and destroy. These are Israelis uh, uh, warheads, which uh, we claim to have used. And subsequently, the Air Force did show the, the photographs of the JM, JEM headquarters with the, uh, with the small holes. So these are bombs which pierced through, right through the building. And because this was the, the stipulation that there's to be no collateral damage. So we went into the, uh, there was no holding back. The answer of to the thousand cuts was we will strike at the time and place of our choosing, anywhere, anytime. I think it will, to a large extent, uh, deter Pakistan without us crossing over to the nuclear threshold. Of course, uh, <coughs> we did lose um, a MiG-21, but that is part of combat. That is, uh, it did uh, f uh, appear to be a setback, and then we claim that we shot down an F-16. <coughs> um, the Pakistanis, of course, have denied it. Um, uh, where we made the mistake was, uh, you know, giving details of the pilot 
of the, the, the F-16 which we had downed. And I searched through Google and I found a, it was claimed to be the son of the deputy chief of the Pakistani Air Force. There was uh, an air marshal with that name, but he denied it. He says both my sons are civilians in the USA. Uh, I don't have a son in the, in the Air Force. So I think when you are giving a, a, a war gaming or giving a, a story, it must be plausible. Uh, it should not be proved. So General Shah, there's, there's a wide consensus that, you know, by and large, uh, even though this, uh, the airstrikes crossing the border uh, actually took us to a new position in response to Pakistan, by and large, there's a consensus that it was a measured, effective uh, piece of action and that, you know, it was handled well. Uh, it was also sort of firewalled with a lot of diplomatic moves. And so it sent out a message that needed to be sent out. Uh, what there has been a lot of controversy and, and discussion about, uh, both by ultranationalists and those who dare to question now, you know, one uses the word dare, is about the if impact of that attack. You know, the, the government claimed, never the army, the government claimed that uh, there were 300 terrorists that were killed. There's been no proof of that. And there's been a lot of noise about not questioning the army, that it's anti-national to question whether 300 terrorists actually died. And all of us have been asked to suspend disbelief and just go with the national narrative. What is your take on that? Uh, I think we've got to believe what the air chief said. Uh, he gave out a very good explanation. He says, we hit the targets. We don't count the casualties. So it was ridiculous to, to start declaring that there were 350, then the 300 and such things. Um, I said that we used the smart 2000 bombs. Uh, and I've also explained that uh, because the stipulation was there should be no collateral damage. Uh, so that was the reason why these sort of warheads were used. Uh, it is, uh, uh, I don't think the politicians should jump in and start declaring something which is, should be the purview of the armed forces. This is something that the politicians need to be careful about. But it has certainly, um, of course, uh, Pakistan did um, live up to their threat. Uh, th they launched the Air Force. Now, um, uh, there is, n uh, I would say, I've not been able to find any conclusive proof that we knocked down a, um, um, uh, an, uh, a Pakistani. Yeah. So, General Shah, you know, you've said somewhere that, and like I said, you've been on many, many battlefronts. Uh, you have a very interesting phrase that you've used, which is to say that in all these battles, it's not the body count that ma matters, but the head count. Uh, would you tell the audience what you mean by that and what has been your experience of head counts versus body count? Uh, no, the head count and the body Th count. That sounds like you've been a scalper, you know? <laughs> it, is, it is the same. It is the same. And uh, the biggest mistake a, s a soldier can make is start counting bodies. Uh, no, you are not really looking at uh, the number of kills at all. What you're lo looking for is the effect of your actions. Uh, uh, about uh, the head count, uh, I was um, in fact involved in an action in, um, in Nagaland. This was in 1984, where uh, we lost uh, a whole platoon uh, to, to the Naga insurgents because of um, they had become, uh, battle fatigue had overtaken them and they had become complacent. So um, when the chief, I was there, when the chief landed up, he asked how many lost. So we told him, sir, 16 killed, three are missing. Uh, well, he says, he told the commanding officer, okay, you've lost 16 men, now make sure that you kill three times the number. This is the General Krishna Rao giving the number which I think was unwarranted. Uh, this is a stipulation which we should not pass on to our command. There's uh, this uh, head count or body count is really the same thing. And we should look at the effect of an action and not the number of people killed. So clearly, General Shah, I'm, I'm, uh, I should become your biographer and remind you of your own thoughts because when you last used this phrase, You'd uh, spoken about how your experience on all these battlefronts have taught you that particularly when there are battle zones within the country and the army is deployed to fight your own citizens who may have some disaffection, 
uh, that it's not the body count, but the attempt to win hearts and minds that actually wins a war. That was the context in which you used that phrase. Uh, so I would love to get your perspective on both Kashmir, the Northeast, Punjab. You know, you've been there on all those fronts. Are we doing the right thing with Kashmir? You know, uh, give us your perspective from your own experience. Yeah. Uh, before I go into Kashmir, I want to just uh, discuss a little about Northeast. Why? Because uh, it has been the longest insurgency. We've been involved in uh, Nagaland from 1947, and then it was the mother of all insurgencies. Uh, it started, and till date, that means uh, it has been almost uh, 75 years, we've not been able to get a hold over the Naga insurgents. So uh, an insurgency can go on and on and on, but the thing is that in case of a stalemate, which has been achieved now, I think the victory is with the side of the government. Uh, the, because the insurgents ultimately will get tired. Now there are two prerequisites for an insurgency to be successful. One is a dissatisfied uh, population. The second is external support from another country. In the Northeast, we've been successful because after the liberation of uh, uh, East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, uh, they, the insurgencies lost their outside support. China got disinterested. It was more interested in modernization. So after losing this, their support, this was one of the reasons. The second reason was that we were very successful in winning over the hearts and minds of the people of the Northeast. Uh, area which we had neglected uh, are now being developed. There's a railway, uh, which is after many, many years, we're extending it down to, uh, to Imphal. Uh, the communications were terrible. The medical facilities were terrible. There were no educational institutions. And uh, so the prerequisites of a successful insurgency have been taken care of. The main thing is winning over the hearts and minds. Uh, the number of insurgents killed really doesn't matter. It will not end in insurgency. And I think the same applies to JNK. Uh, what the, um, the mistake we are making is uh, count the number killed of insurgents. No, that doesn't matter. Because when one is killed, what is uh, important winning the hearts and minds? Uh, let me also tell you that in the Northeast, we took care to ensure that any military action did not result in collateral damage. This was something very, very important. We learned it from the American experience in Vietnam, where they followed the scorched earth policy. That means if a village is harboring an insurgent, go and burn and destroy the village. Now that certainly was a very ham-handed way of resolving an insurgency. We tried that for many years in Nagaland till we realized that it is not, it will not succeed. So I think the same lessons need to be implemented in JNK. Uh, the scorched earth policy will not work. I'll tell you, in uh, the Northeast, when I was uh, there as a major and then subsequently as a brigadier, and then subsequently when I commanded a corps in the Northeast, what I, I always said is go in for the insurgent. If he takes shelter in a house, don't blow it up. Because what will happen, uh, you blow that house, that family is never going to forgive you. And all the relatives of that family will be ripe for plucking by the insurgent groups. So I said, let him escape. Doesn't matter. But do not take action where there will be a, la a huge uh, uh, um, well, damage to a civilian building or anything like that. We took care to ensure that there are no civil casualties. We took care to ensure that the local people are not, uh, well, uh, well uh, their discomfort is not added. You know, there are a lot of things like for cordon and search, you get the people out in the freezing cold, keep them out. All these things irritate the local population and only spurs insurgency. One man wrongly killed, uh, an innocent man, 
means the whole family is ripe for plucking. So these are lessons which we learned in uh, the Northeast. These are lessons we learned from the American experience in Vietnam. And, and Punjab. And, and Punjab. I think this is what we need to implement in JNK. So, uh, General Shah, we'll move away now to, you know, the 1971 war as well as Gujarat and then, like I said, your personal life. But just one last question because that is, uh, again, something around which there seems to be no consensus. Uh, and perhaps you might uh, have an idea about how to deal with it, which is the stone pelters in Kashmir. Uh, exactly what you're talking about, you know. So even if you keep the Pakistan uh, uh, interference and, and their meddling in Kashmir affairs and whatever they are engendering, there is also deep disaffection and alienation amongst the population. And every time that there is a stone pelting season, uh, the casualties are so huge. You know, you have more than a thousand children blinded last year, the year before. Uh, and like you're saying, that then there's a kind of ripple effect. Concentric circles of uh, bitterness and anger and alienation continue to happen. From all these years that you've fought on battle lines, if you were today in a position of power in, in, in the Kashmiri situation, how would you take on the kind of stone pelting that the army or the police have to face in Kashmir? Well, um, you know, there's been a very um, uh, undesirable or dangerous uh, turn of events. Earlier, most of the action was by foreign terrorists. But of late, uh, the dissatisfied and disgruntled youth in the valley have taken part in stone throwing and everything else. I do not approve of the idea of uh, using shotgun pellets uh, because those only maim. And uh, the aim, uh, if you fire, fire for effect and fire below the belt. This is the lesson which we always uh, taught our troops, um, fire below the belt. But I certainly don't approve of the action of this is an Israeli tactics. Uh, there's a lot of difference. You know, we uh, advocate the use of Israeli tactics. But we forget that um, the, uh, this, the ground situation is totally different. The Hamas and others do not have the capability to, to react to this. Whereas the Pakistan, which, has got, uh, uh, which is aiding and abetting terrorism and uh, the insurgents in Kashmir, uh, do have the capability to, uh, to counter uh, uh, the thing, uh, Indian um, uh, actions. Um, I think the, uh, you know, another th very successful um, experiment which we tried out in the Northeast was, you know, there's a culture of uh, every man being armed. Uh, it is a gun culture which was always there in the Northeast. Uh, we did not, uh, whenever we captured insurgents, uh, we turned them over, we created uh, BSF battalions with captured insurgents, surrendered insurgents. It was very, very successful. Uh, in my brigade, there was a, uh, a battalion with, uh, with, with a gang of, uh, uh, of insurgents, uh, Naga insurgents who were coming back from, from uh, China, and we converted the whole gang into a BSF battalion. I think this would be a risk worth taking. Um, Allowing the, uh, firstly declaring an all-time amnesty, giving the insurgents a chance to surrender, and then absorbing them into the paramilitary forces. It is, um, it is a risk which is worth taking. It is something which has proved extremely um, successful in the Northeast. I don't know how successful it will be in uh, JNK, but it is a risk worth taking. So um, the important thing is that Pakistan must get the message that uh, firstly, their aiding and abetting uh, the insurgents will call for a repost, we will reply. Uh, that may uh, cut off the, um, the aid they are giving, but I doubt it. I doubt it very so much. You know, uh, General Shah, uh, I'm, I'm going to move away because we'll soon run out of time. but. It's very interesting, you were talking about the paramilitary and you know, you uh, even in Gujarat uh, during the riots, you know, you had an experience of how uh, ineffective they can be sometimes and they're really deployed very randomly and casually across the country. Uh, but it's very interesting that after the Pulwama attack, though they had lost 40 Jawans, even while the political establishment across the spectrum, whether they were opposition leaders or the government, 
were shy of responding with the constitutional conviction that Kashmiri students across the country should not be uh, attacked in retaliation. It's very interesting that within a couple of hours, it was the CRPF that put out a helpline for Kashmiri students or uh, traders anywhere in the country to say that if they were being attacked, they could call the CRPF uh, helpline for, uh, for help, you know. I, I think that was a very proud moment for all of us uh, that the, the battalions that had been affected the most actually put out a helpline more quickly than the political uh, establishment did, you know, uh, talking about winning over hearts. But I'd like to move away to, to Gujarat and the title of your book being Sarkari Musliman, uh, you foregrounded your identity as a Muslim uh, officer, you know. Why did you name your book that? So before I come to Gujarat, why did you foreground your identity as a Muslim? And did that play any role in these 40 years of service in the army? What was your experience? Uh, firstly, it played no role at all. My religion didn't matter because my religion was the army while I served in it. Uh, it was between me and me and my maker. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you that there's no contradiction between the, uh, my, my belief in my country and belief in my religion. They are not contradictory at all in any way. Uh, why I named my book The Sarkari Musliman is that a government servant, a Muslim government servant, especially an army officer, has to walk a tightrope between loyalty to his job, that means loyalty to his country, but you cannot neglect, neglect or overlook the loyalty to your community because, uh, because then if you do that, you will become a Sarkari Musliman. And um, uh, I borrowed this uh, thing from, from my experience as a young captain where I tried to motivate a group of horsemen who I met in Masuri. Uh, they were the Aligarh Muslim riding team uh, which had come to participate in the Indian Military Academy horse show. And I told them the honor of glory of wearing a uniform and I tried to motivate them into opting for the National Defense Academy. When I was through, I asked, how many of you want to join the army? Not a single hand was raised. So I said, weren't you convinced by what I told you? And they replied in unison, Janab, aap to sarkari musalman hai. That means what you are doing is pushing a government agenda. So it is really a tight rope. But let me tell you that uh, my religion didn't come to play as uh, was pointed out. Nobody probably, if you ask for General Zamiruddin Shah, they say, who's that? But if you ask for General Zum Shah, they'll understand, okay, that fellow. So this is a thing uh, that is uh, prevalent in the army. Every officer has a nickname, which is not related to religion or caste or creed. It relates to some characteristic of yours, which is uh, the why you bear a name. So um, that is why I named my book The Sarkari Musliman. But uh, General Shah, when you, when you recount this uh, episode, is that a kind of indication of, you know, of what the community generally feels? Is that an uncomfortable reality that uh, the community would not, by and large, want to join the army or have an allegiance with the government? Because there is a rift between uh, Muslim, and I say this speaking as a complete and committed secularist and a complete and declared anti-communalist, but when you, when you give this uh, insight, uh, should we reckon with the fact that there is an alienation in the Muslim community where they would not want to join the army, they would see that as capitulation uh, to hold a government job or be part of the army? Yes, uh, what happened was the, the night my call-up letter came, I was um, sitting with the Malvi. He used to come and teach me Arabic and Urdu. And when this call-up letter came, my father says, you've been called up to, for NDA. So when my father left, the Malvi told me, Mat jana. Tumare khilaf taasub hoga. That means there will be discrimination against you. So I told my father, Ke Malvi was telling me this. And he said, don't worry about this, these fellows. What has happened is, uh, having spent 40 years and uh, never having faced any discrimination at all, and I say it without being a hypocrite. Uh, in fact, I faced only affirmative action, and so did my brothers. My brother went to IIT, I went off to NDA, and Nasir, of course, ran off, but he still made good. <laughs> he still made good, so it only proves uh, I am totally convinced, and this is the message I conveyed in Aligarh Muslim University during my five years. I said, there certainly is discrimination, but against whom? They say, against us Muslims, no. I said, 
discrimination is against the less educated. And I don't think I was wrong. Discrimination is against the less educated. The Muslims and the Dalits, unfortunately, are less educated. So obviously, who's going to give them a job? So things have changed. I was the lone Muslim amongst the 200 cadets in my uh, course. But now, they are, I find 10 or 12 young Muslims, which is a very, very positive sign. Uh, young Muslims have realized that uh, this is their country. They, they are also responsible for security. So amongst the, I won't say amongst the Muslim masses, but amongst the less educated, there's always an element of fear. There's always an element of, uh, of being discriminated. And unfortunately, the developments in the last few years have heightened this fear with um, Gaurakshaks running amok, nothing being done to them, and uh, other developments. Uh, it has heightened uh, the, the fears of the minorities who have now withdrawn into a shell. Uh, I've seen it in happening in Ahmedabad during the 2002 riots. Uh, the, the Muslims who were living in, uh, uh, in joint colonies have now withdrawn and gone into ghettoized localities. Now that is something which is uh, destructive towards the pluralistic uh, environment, the society which we are trying to, uh, trying to nurture and encourage. So um, uh, I think that the education will take care of a lot of the fears of any community, let it be Dalits or Muslims or anybody, uh, if they are convinced that uh, uh, the education is the panacea for most of the ills. So I'm going to come back to some of all the many substantive issues we still have to discuss. But since you brought up Nasir, uh, tell us a little about this errant brother of yours uh, who ran away not just from the family, but the family tradition. Uh, you know, as I said, he had 200 years. I mean, you come from a family of 200 years of service. Sometimes you fought with the British, sometimes, you know, with the Indian side. And of course, since 1947, you know, you've had a history of being uh, in the army. Why was uh, Nasir so anti the family ethos? And how difficult was it for him to be a child in your family? How difficult was it for you to be his brother? Well, uh, uh, Nasir was always uh, my, the favorite, being the youngest. Uh, you know, there was a very interesting article in Time magazine as to who's the favorite in the family, the eldest or the middle. We are three brothers. I was in the middle. So I, d I don't claim that I was uh, the family favorite, but he certainly was. And uh, my father always looked down on this profession of acting. Uh, there had been a few uncles who had, uh, who had been actors. And uh, Nasir secretly toyed with the idea. And one fine day when he was hardly 16 years old, he ran away. He disappeared for six months. And we couldn't trace him out. Uh, finally, uh, since uh, Yusuf Hans, that means Dilip Kumar, uh, his sister was living very next, uh, very near to us in Ajmer, where my father was the administrator of the Darga. We requested help, and Nasir was traced out in Bombay. And he tells the story that one day, uh, what he was doing, he was trying to become an actor. But all he got was a job in the sets, shifting flower pots and putting up uh, screens and everything else, where he used to be paid 10 rupees a day. So he says, uh, this limousine stopped and a lady beckoned him. She said, you're Nasiruddin Shah? He said, yes. She said, get in. So he said, ah, discovered. <laughs> and uh, she took him home and there Dilip Kumar gave him uh, uh, a piece of his mind and a servant was, was uh, appointed to escort him back home. So my father and Nasir had a pact that, um, okay, if you want to pursue acting, uh, do it but finish your graduation. So he went off to Aligarh Muslim University, which I think was a very good thing that happened because we were, we were taught in a school where the, all of us were English speaking, English thinking. Uh, we had become Anglophiles. But uh, in Aligarh Muslim University, he learned the nuance of Urdu and Hindi, and that stood him in good stead. And after he left uh, from Aligarh, he qualified for the National School of Drama and then to the Pula Film Institute, and then went off for a course in Poland. So there was no looking back. So I, I'm only trying to show that is really education and talent which will help a person to climb and nothing else. Religion and all doesn't matter. 
So uh, I've constantly lived under shadow and I've got no problems with that because uh, living under the shadow of the best actor in the country, I say that with authority. Uh, I, I've got no problems in living. Having lived under shadow, uh, he wanted, my father allowed us to pursue the career of our choice. My eldest brother, as I said, uh, migrated. He went off to, to all over the place. He married an Egyptian and is uh, now settled in Egypt. So it really doesn't matter. Uh, we are all very, very proud of the fact that we went to good schools, and that is what we are trying to pass on to the rest of the community. So I, uh, you know, General Shah always talks about this emphasis on uh, education. He has a very humorous chapter in his book where he talks about the kind of questions that he's put through uh, by strangers. You know, there's a standard set of 12 questions that people ask him about Nasir always. Uh, and the first one is always that, is he your real brother? You know, so <laughs> because they're so radically different, including having a radically different view on education. Because uh, Nasir has been on the algebra stage uh, several times. And he insists that education is the worst path to success. Uh, you know? <laughs> and my children have decided to give up on education after hearing Nasir. So we should have General Shah more often than Nasir you know, on, on this stage. Uh, yes, uh, Nasir and I, um, well, uh, we, we both share our love for games and the outdoors. And uh, one thing in uh, common is that uh, both of us practice the arts. Uh, he practices the, the fine arts. I practice the martial arts. So, so <laughs> that's where <laughs> we are similar. But uh, yet, um, we have got so much in common. And uh, I think it's this, uh, the success will come from. So, so I'm so sorry to cut you, General Shah, but we, we, you know, the bell is rung and we have just a few minutes left. Uh, two questions. One is, out of all these, you know, you served in 1971 in Punjab, everywhere. Tell us about one of the most, for you, tense, dangerous moments in your entire career. And the second is, you know, again, it's for insight, because there's a big sort of prejudice against madrasa education. Even Aligarh Muslim uh, University now has become the new JNU. You know, it's the hotbed of anti-nationals and terrorists, according to the media narrative. Give us an insight into what it was to have a madrasa education and what Aligarh Muslim University stands for. Right. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I started my education in a madrasa. Uh, when I was a young kid of four and a half years old, I went to the family madrasa. I studied there for one year and then went off to, to St. Mary's and St. Joseph's College. So I had the best of, uh, so I look upon madrasas not as terrorist producing factories. No, they're not. It is just that the pass outs of the madrasas are ill-equipped to have, well, uh, they do not know the art of bread and butter. They've been given uh, uh, lessons in religion and theology, but not in bread and butter. So this is something which we need to change. The madrasa, I've been stressing on that. Uh, we started a course called the Bridge Course in Aligarh Muslim University, where we are training young madrasa boys and girls to, to learn the art of uh, earning bread and butter. That's number one. Uh, <coughs> so um, this is very, very important. School education, of course, is something which, uh, since I benefited so much from a good school, we are on a mission to transform the Muslim community through uh, modern secular education. That means we need to inculcate, that means we need children to study in schools where children of all religions study so that they can be friends. This is something which is very, very important. So. Good schooling in secular schools and reformation of the madrasas are the crying needs of the Muslim community. And I asked you about either the most disturbing or okay. dangerous moment. Was it with the Gujarat riots or in, in 1971? Tell us about some. Instances. Yes, um, I think the most uh, taxing period of my life was uh, sorting out the Gujarat riots. I was flown in into a city which was burning. I could see it when we landed on the night of uh, uh, 28th, 28th first, uh, 28th February, 1st March 2002. And um, I found that the help which was to be given to the army, the Air Force had arranged 60 flights. We brought in 3,000 troops uh, into the Ahmedabad airfield. But the aid which we are looking for from the civil administration, that means they were to provide us vehicles, they were to provide us maps, 
They were to provide us magistrates, police escorts, as well as uh, mobile sets, because our communications uh, would not work. These were not provided, despite the fact that the SIT report incorrectly says that everything was provided. No, it was not. I say it with authority. It was not provided for 36 hours. And we were sitting on the airfield. Uh, and uh, we could hear the gunfire and the shots and everything else. Anyway, let me tell you that um, the army did not take very long. Once we got the wherewithal, we quelled the riots by firm, fair, and resolute action. This is what the army always does. And the riots were quelled within 48 hours. This is something to the credit of the army. They did not take sides. They just shot at whoever was an arsonist. And the message went home that the army will not tolerate any lawlessness. It was a trying period for me because I knew that I was under constant observation. There were some eyebrows raised as to how I had been selected uh, to lead the troops which had been committed into Gujarat. And the reply given by the army is that we did not select a Muslim general. We only committed the commander of the force committed. And the force committed was my division. So obviously, I had to head the, the, uh, the operation in Gujarat. So this is the way how the army looks at where religion, race, color, or, or anything like that doesn't matter. It is the responsibility is given, and then it is left to you to execute, the, to make sure that you get success. Thank you very, very much, uh, General Shah. You know, as, as I said, it's particularly a privilege to have you at this moment when there's very, very heightened rhetoric uh, around the army. It's one of our proudest institutions, proudly secular, proudly committed to constitutional values. Uh, and I think we collectively need to resist any attempts to politicize a very upright institution. Uh, meeting you is a reminder of that. So thank you very, very much, uh, General Shah, for being here. Thank, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, the army must remain above religion, above caste and creed. That is the strength of our army, and I think it's the strength of our country. That's all I'd say. Jai Hind. Thank you.